morning and welcome. Let's stand together. Let's sing to our God. Crown of thorns upon his 
dedicate this Sunday morning to welcoming a new senior pastor. Let us also ourselves dedicate us anew to devoting ourselves to God, to living for Him, and to serving Him with our whole lives. As we do that, God enables us, and He says, your labors are never in vain as we pursue Him and serve Him. Let's hear that hope from these verses in 1 Corinthians 15. Do you read the words in yellow as I read the words in white? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But, but thanks, thanks be to God, who gives, gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen.
Father, we say to you again today that you are our God and we are your people, and we ask that you would help us to be devoted to you and to you alone. God, we want to live for you. We want to be satisfied in you. We want to proclaim your name across the earth, and yet we recognize that without your help, we cannot do that. And so we ask again this morning for your help. And even as we walk through a transition in leadership, we say again, like we've said before, we trust you, God, and we want you more and more, and we can't wait for the day you'll come back again. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Well, welcome. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm really glad to be together with you all this morning. If you're new and visiting with us, we'd love to get to know you a little bit. And one way we can do that is by uh, opening up the bulletin that you received on the way in. And inside there's something called a connect card. Feel free to fill out as much information as you feel comfortable. And then just drop it in the offering box in the lobby on the way out. It's one of the ways that we can get to know you this coming week. I've got a handful of announcements for us. If you are a part of men's leadership development, one of the 80 or 90 guys, we're going to get started in a couple of weeks, but the material that you need is ready for you to pick up. And I'm going to tell you where in just a second. But in addition to that, if you are a part of the women's Bible study, if you're doing it remotely and you need to pick up some material, if you want to register for some of the women's events coming up, 
I'm going to tell you where to go. So you, along with the guys who are picking up the men's leadership development items, go to the Live for the Line sign, which is in the Crossway Kids Wing, just right out these doors and to the right, and those things will be available for you there. Next Sunday, we're starting a new sermon series in the book of Ephesians, and it has been, and has, our practice in the past has been to have these things called scripture journals. They look like this, um, and it's a way for you to take notes. It's a way for you to kind of follow along and take it home, and so if you'd like one of these journals, if you'd like to purchase it, it's also by the Live for the Line sign in the kids' wing. The last thing is, if you would like to be a part of helping train pastors to preach and lead their congregations faithfully, every year we host a conference here called the Simeon Trust to do just that. And many of you are a part of pulling that event off. And so if you'd like more information about how you can get involved, there is an insert in your bulletin and there's a sign-up table way in the back. You'll see it on your way out. Please stop by there to get connected. I said the last thing, but it's actually not the last thing. I tricked you. Um, I got one more thing for you. At Crossway, one of the best ways to start and develop meaningful relationships are through gospel communities. Gospel communities are small groups of people who aim to be a family of disciples on mission. They meet throughout the week, all over town, really all over this region, uh, and they're a great way to not only meet other people, but to grow deeper in your walk with God. Today, I want you to see all of the leaders. So if you're a leader, would you please stand up? And most of them are wearing a shirt that looks like the one I'm wearing right now. And the reason I want you to see them is if you are interested in learning more about a gospel community or just have a question uh, about what a gospel community is all about, let me encourage you to find one of them and they'll be happy to tell you about it uh, and to tell you the, the full truth. I've asked them to be straight up with you. Um, but they're a great resource if you're interested in learning more. You all can take a seat. Um, and if you'd like more information, there is a spot in the Connect card uh, where you can just check off Gospel Communities and drop that off in the offering box, and we'll be in touch with you this coming week. Well, now let's continue to worship our Lord in song. Sing this asking that the Lord would be our vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day.
Steve, when you get your guitar off there, I wonder if you would just stay up here for a second. Before I do anything else this morning, I want to say a few words to Pastor Moore. Um, where did you go? <laughs> Steve, thank you for leading us in worship Sunday by Sunday. Um, I want to thank you particularly for the way that you lead us and you have led us Sunday by Sunday. This past week, I was looking at some old sermon notes, and uh, I came across a sermon that I preached on the church at worship. Um, and near the end of that sermon, I spoke some words to Pastor Moore. This is from November 8th. 2009, and here's what I said, Pastor Moore, I'm speaking for this body, and then I said, I called every one of these people last night, and they all agreed. Um, thank you for faithfully, diligently thinking and discerning and choosing songs that magnify Christ. You said a beautiful example of that just now. Thank you for the fact that our song diet is rich in Christ. Thank you for helping us see Christ through bringing scripture to shed light and through your pastoral exhortations. And thank you for protecting us in our worship from mere formalism, where we're only singing because everybody else is singing. And on the other hand, protecting us from mere emotionalism. Steve Moore, I said, I am, we are, so very grateful to God for you. That's what I said 15 years ago, and it's still true. Um, you have been such a faithful pastor to us in this way. And I want you all to know that one of the highlights, one of the great joys of my job has been working closely with Steve week by week thinking about planning for Sundays and then on Sunday mornings, worshiping alongside my wife under your leadership. That has been such a place of joy for me. I'm thankful that that won't stop. Um, Beverly and I are going to be sitting someplace else, but we'll still be enjoying and benefiting from your leadership. So brother, thank you. Um, thank you for your labor. Thank you for your heart for the Lord. Thank you for your partnership in ministry for the vast majority of these 25 years. I have loved working with you, Steve. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a privilege. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to make sure I don't fail to acknowledge a couple other guests with us this morning. Uh, Bill and Marg Wendell, Brett's mom and dad, and Elaine, Kim's mom. So glad you could be here today. Very special day and all the more special for you being here. Thank you. So this is uh, my last Sunday as senior pastor here. And by the way... Um, thank you all for these wonderful bird postcards that you have written for Beverly and me. I am continuing to make my way through these, and they have been just a delight to read. Um, many of them have come from children. And one of them, which I got a kick out of, was just wonderfully brief. Um, it had just eight words on it. Um, thank you for being a good pastor. Goodbye. Wasn't quite sure how to interpret the goodbye. <laughs> so, Jacob, thank you for that sweet little card. Um, even though it's my last Sunday in this role, I want you to know that Beverly and I are not leaving. Um, we're going to have to decide which service that we'll attend, but we will be faithfully here. I do want you to know that for the next good number of Sundays, I will be away preaching uh, at a church in Chicago that is itself in the middle of a transition. And so I'll just be um, serving, helping out there. 
Um, but I tell you that because I just don't want you to misinterpret my absence as something other than that. We love this church. Um, we feel this is our church family, this church body, and we'll be here as, I trust, faithful members for years and years to come. And children, uh, once more again this morning, we want to welcome you to be with us. There's a really important thing that's happening today, and we want you to be a part of that. Um, you are a much-loved children, much-loved and very important part of this church family. And as we transition to a new senior pastor this morning, we want you to be here to witness that and to feel God's goodness and care for our church. So we're really glad that you're here. Now, this morning's time of preaching is going to be a little different. We will still be opening God's Word and we'll seek to anchor ourselves here in the truth of God's Word. In fact, you'll see two scripture passages printed for you in your bulletin. You might want to have those in front of you. But the message this morning is going to have two distinct parts, and the first part of the message is addressed to just one person, and that's Pastor Brett. I asked him if he would be so kind as to sit here because I didn't want to keep looking to my left all morning, and I also told him in the office beforehand, I said, buddy, brace yourself, I'm going to be saying your name a lot this morning. We call this a charge, a charge to the new pastor. God has said some things in his word that Brett needs to hear things that he needs to get bolted deeply into his heart so that he lives by them. And so that's what I'm going to do in the first roughly half of this message. And the rest of you are not just welcome, but highly encouraged to listen in. But then in the second part of this message, I will speak to all of us, a charge to the church. God has said some things that we need to hear as a church about what it means to be a church. And so I'll take the second half this morning to speak to us. And when I'm finished, Brett will come up and he will have some words to say in response. And then I will ask him to publicly affirm some commitments before us as a church. And then the elders will gather around Brett and Kim and their family and we will pray for them. So, Brett. I have a very simple charge to you this morning. It can be captured in just a few words. Brett, as you assume this responsibility as of today, I want to charge you to be a pastor. Be a good and faithful pastor. Now, obviously, I'm trying to say something here. That word pastor means something very specific and very special. The word pastor is the translation of a Greek word, which is the word for shepherd. And so, Brett, what I'm saying is, be a shepherd. Be a good and faithful shepherd of the church. You are not just a preacher. And you don't have to be some great visionary leader. You don't have to be some great administrative force in the office, but you have to be. You must be a pastor a shepherd. Many men in this role are tempted to be other things. And you will be tempted as well. You'll feel pressure to be other things. And every time you feel that temptation, I want you to remember what I'm saying to you this morning. In fact, far more important than me saying it, I want you to remember what God's word says. Be a pastor. The apostle Peter makes this wonderfully stark and direct statement speaking to those who have been given responsibility for the spiritual health and well-being of a local gathering of believers. Peter says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Be a shepherd. Be a pastor. And that is my charge to you this morning, Brett. Be a pastor. Be our pastor. Our shepherd. Brett, it's important for you to remember we have a chief shepherd. You don't need to be that. In fact, he's your shepherd as well. But be our under-shepherd, our pastor. 
Now, I'm wanting to get somewhere with this this morning. There is a place I'm headed, and I'm pretty sure you know exactly where I'm going. But we need to start here with a clear understanding of what you are and what you've been called to. You're a pastor, and a pastor is a shepherd who watches over and takes care for and sees to the well-being of the flock. And having started there, let me now take four brief, I hope very clear steps to get to where I'm headed this morning in my charge to you. Step number one. The primary responsibility of the shepherd is to see that the sheep are fed. Primary responsibility you bear as our shepherd is to see that we are fed. There's a very graphic, very sobering passage in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34. It's God speaking against the shepherds, the pastors of Israel. And what he says to them is that he's against them because instead of feeding the sheep, they are feeding themselves on the sheep, fattening themselves at the expense of the people under their care. Just listen to this. Ezekiel 34, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. And on that chapter goes with this heavy denunciation of these shepherds for not doing what shepherds are supposed to do, and that is see that the sheep are fed. You know, it's so striking to me that when Jesus is reinstating, reinstalling Peter after Peter denied Jesus three times, he asks him, remember this? Do you love me, Peter? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus says to him, do you remember? Feed my sheep, feed them. Brad, it will be your responsibility, not yours alone, but primarily yours, to make sure the people of Crossway Community Church are fed. That's step number one. Step number two, the food the sheep, the people of God need is God's word. The food that we need is from this book. This could not be more clear. There's a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that has some very famous words in it. In fact, Jesus quotes these words at one point. Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's what Moses says to the people in Deuteronomy chapter 8. But in order to feel the full effect of those words, we need to hear what Moses said just before that. Just listen. It's chapter 8. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now listen to this. And he humbled you and he let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know nor did your fathers know, that he might make known to you that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. In other words, God let the people get hungry physically, And then he fed them so that they would know they're still not satisfied. Listen, we were made for more than our physical appetites. We were made for more than bread. There's a part of us, and it's the most important part of us, that needs a different kind of food. We were made by God, and we were made like God, and we were made for God, and our true selves need God. And we live on God through his words. So, Brett, the food that the people of Crossway need that you are to feed us is God's word. That's step number two. Step number three, preaching is the primary means by which God's word is brought effectively to God's people. Preaching, this act, is the primary means by which God's word is brought effectively to God's people. Brett, you've heard me say this probably dozens of times. Preaching is your primary task. There's no more important or effective way that you can lead or serve this church than in your preparation to preach and in your delivery of that word Sunday by Sunday. 
Now, the fact is, you will need to do some other things. There is some planning, and there is some organizing, and there's some personal care, and there's some engaging with the team. There's meetings to go to, emails to answer. You need to do those things, and a host of other things that I haven't named. But you must do this. While preaching is not the only thing you do as a pastor, it must be the first thing, the prioritized thing. Paul said to Timothy, devote yourself. Brett, hear those words. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. There is no more potent means through which you will have greater opportunity to speak life into us than your weekly preaching Standing here in this place is the most influential time you have to lead. God has ordained this, this apparent foolishness and weakness of preaching with just ordinary guys feeling small, which you will feel every week. Weak, speaking words to accomplish great things. So you must do this and you must prioritize this and protect this. Brett, guard your calendar. You will have much to do. There's room. Protect for this. Get away from this place. Find a quiet place to be alone with God's word so you can give yourself to the task. Your people's lives, their real lives depend on it. Preaching is the primary means by which God's word is brought effectively to God's people. That's step three. And so now, step four, the place that I have wanted to get, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. Let me read that. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Brett, preach the word. Pastor the people by preaching the word of God to them. And please notice that last phrase. With great patience and careful instruction. I've often referred to that line in connection with parenting, and my goodness, does it ever apply with great patience and careful instructions. In fact, sometimes I've so associated that line with parenting that I, that I forget that it's actually spoken in connection with preaching. With great patience, careful instruction, because it takes time, and sometimes we're slow and stubborn. So preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Re- reprove, rebuke, exhort, with complete patience and teaching. It's so interesting to me that these words in the middle of that verse, reprove, rebuke, exhort, are are virtual repetitions of the characteristics of Scripture that Paul mentions a chapter earlier in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And the point is, That there in chapter 4, verse 2, is that Timothy is to preach the word so that it will do the work that God has designed it to do. And Brett, it's important that I add, it needs to do its work in you first. John Owen once said, if the word does not dwell in power in us, it cannot, it will not pass with power from us. Brett, I want you to know, as I've sat and listened to you preach many times now, I have thought over and over again, God is putting our church in good hands. I am so encouraged. But I want to say to you today, do not get distracted. Don't think, well, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to be this, I've got to be that. You devote yourself to this. Be a pastor. Be a good pastor. Give yourself to the preparation and delivery of God's word. Feed Christ's sheep. Feed this flock. And I will be praying for you week in and week out. As I know many others will. 
that God will enable you to live a life worthy of his calling and give you everything you need to accomplish his good purposes through your pastoring. And I will pray that you will always maintain a sense of awe and trembling at the responsibility and joyful privilege of preaching God's word to God's people. God bless you, brother, and God bless this people through you. Now, church, more briefly, but no less directly, let me speak a word to you. And my charge to you will be simple as well. Be a church. Be a church. Be a good and faithful church. Now, again, obviously, I'm trying to say something here. That word church means something very specific and very special. The word church in the New Testament, literally means gathering. It speaks of a local gathering of believers, a gathering of Christ followers, a group that God has formed into a body where we're members of that body together, and what members of a body do is care for one another. We hold one another up. It's part of our membership commitment. We have vowed that we'll help each other through all the way to heaven. Or to use the language of Hebrews, we've committed to encourage one another and all the more as we see that day approaching. You know, there are so many places in the Bible that speak about this. In fact, a good part of the New Testament is dedicated to helping us understand what it means to be a church and to help us actively be that. I'm so thrilled that Brett's going to start his preaching in the book of Ephesians, which is dedicated to helping us understand what it means to be the church and helping us to actually be that church. But I have chosen just one passage this morning. It captures so beautifully, so simply, so profoundly this main thing about being a church and what it means to care for one another. Time and time again, the Bible speaks of this the call to be purposely about helping one another to faithfully follow Jesus. And that's what I see here in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Look at it with me. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all of these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, there are other things that the church is called to do, to bear witness in the world, to do acts of mercy to people in need, to look forward to Christ coming together. But for now, this is the main thing. Help each other together. Encourage one another together. Care for each other together. That's, that's what I see here. I love the warmth and the closeness. We might even see, say the intimacy of this passage. It gives us some things to pursue Verse 12, compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience, crossway, be a church by pursuing those things. And it gives us a reality check, telling us we're not always going to do those things in verse 12 perfectly. I mean, it's not easy to live out these precious realities with each other. Many things work against this, not the least of which our own selfishness. And can I, can I just say that the beauty of the gospel is put on even greater display when we can care for and honor one another despite one another's weaknesses and failures. So, verse 13, bear with one another crossway. And if 
anyone has a complaint against another, forgive one another. Crossway, be a church by purposefully, intentionally bearing with and forgiving each other. And then it tells us the golden secret to it all in verse 14. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Crossway, be a church this way. Love one another with a deeply committed love. And please notice this passage directs us as a church, not just to one another, but to our great chief shepherd. Look at verses 15 and 16 and 17 again. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You were called to this in one body. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Crossway, you've been called into one body and Jesus is Lord and King and Chief Shepherd here. And there are wonderful gifts that he has given to us. His peace, verse 15. This wonderful reality that he's purchased for us. Peace. Let it rule here. This is what we've been called into as a body. The peace of Christ. So when you come here on Sunday, nothing else should be ruling in your heart. Not your fears. Not your self-assessment of how you're doing. Not your attempt to impress God or other people. Let the peace of Christ rule here. And he's given his word, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell richly. Let it dwell richly among us in our singing and in our speaking to one another personally and certainly in our hearing of God's word. So receive from your new teaching pastor the word of Christ, the gospel, and bring it into your hearts so that you can live by it every day. And he's given us his name over all. His name. One name upon our lips. Jesus, verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let his name be magnified in everything we do. So dear brothers and sisters, let's, let's be a church a real church, a good and faithful church, this church, this body together for each other and ultimately for the glory of Christ. Crossway, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Bread, come. Good morning, Crossway. Late last year, in the course of my just regular reading through the Bible, I was struck by a passage in John's Gospel that I think provides a wonderful picture of it, at least what's at the heart of the aim of pastoral ministry. So I want to read it for you. This is John chapter 3, verses 25 to 30. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. John had been something of a phenomenon. 
crowds, large crowds, had been going out to him at the Jordan where he was baptizing to hear his preaching, to confess their sins, to be baptized by him, to prepare the way for the Lord. Jesus came among them. He submitted to John's baptism. But over time, fewer and fewer came to John. And more and more were going out to Jesus to hear his preaching, to be baptized by his disciples. And those who saw this must have wondered, what does it mean to John that all are now going out to Jesus? And they come to John, tell him what's going on, and he gives them this word picture. He says, the one to whom the bride goes is the bridegroom. I am the bridegroom's friend who rejoices to see the bride and the bridegroom together. In other words, I didn't come to gather the people to me. I came to point them to Jesus. My joy is to see them loving him. My longing is that he would increase, that he would be the focus of trust and praise and adoration, and that I would decrease into obscurity. And that, I think, is the heart of a pastor. And I think the New Testament bears witness to it because the picture recurs in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Paul says, I feel a divine jealousy for you, Corinthians, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. His aim for the church in Corinth was to help them grow in godliness and in purity so they might be pleasing to Christ, so that they might belong to him. It's the aim of a pastor, the joy of a pastor, to see those he loves and cares for growing in love for and trust in and devotion to Jesus. And the primary means by which that happens is by proclaiming Jesus, who he is and what he's done for us and for our salvation. Colossians 1, verse 28, him we proclaim, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. It is my desire, and as best as I understand it, God's call on my life to do that among this people as a member of this team of elders. How, how long I'll do it is in God's hands, but it is my desire that this would be the primary labor of my life and the last job I have. I understand that in this work, I am accountable to you, to the other elders, and ultimately, primarily to God. Hebrews 13, 17 instructs the church to obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. I and the elders and Mike will have to give an account for our care for you, for what we have taught, for the example we set, for how we watch out for you, pursue you, pray for you, warn you. We can probably not remind ourselves of that too often. In fact, the Apostle Paul warns pastors concerning the areas about which they must be vigilant in order to please God. Acts 20, verse 28 says, Pay care careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Pay attention to the flock, Paul says, to the people among whom God has placed you, the people so precious to him that he exchanged his son's blood for their life with him forever. But along with that, even before that, pay attention to yourselves that you do not become a means by which those precious sheep are led astray. Again, in 1 Timothy 4.16, keep a close watch, Timothy, on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. Watch the teaching, he says. Be sure that what you tell the church is true and sound, that it announces God as he really is. Salvation as it really is, the Christian life as it really is. Be sure the teaching points to Christ, but along with that, even before that, watch yourself. Be sure that your life is exemplary, that it agrees with and does not undermine the teaching, that it adorns the gospel you preach. Before God, I am responsible to watch my life, 
to watch my teaching, and to watch over you. Each of the elders is. It is in faithfulness to those responsibilities that we are able to point you to Jesus so you grow in your love for him, so we become a pure bride for him. And I want you to know that as, I, as I'm coming into this position, I'm coming aware of those responsibilities and taking them seriously. And I want you to know that I am acutely aware of my need for God in order to do that. If the Apostle Paul could say, who is sufficient for these things? How much more ought I? So I would invite you to pray for me. Please pray that my life would be pleasing to God. My example, my marriage, my parenting. Please pray that I would be devoted to and teach the Christ-centered, utterly trustworthy word of God. And please pray that by God's grace, I would keep watch over this church in a way that I will not be ashamed to have done when Christ returns. Please pray the same for the elder team. And I know that you will. As I have watched you care for Mike over the last year, as I've seen you honor him, I feel so privileged to be part of a church that knows how to love their pastors. Not every pastor is. Thank you for how you have prayed for us. Pray for us still. And as you pray, as we enter into this season, let's make sure our confidence is fixed in the right place. Yes, there are things for us to do, things to keep watch over, things to guard, things to pursue. We will all give an account to the Lord, but our confidence is not in our efforts. It is in the goodness, the faithfulness, the steadfast love of a very present and promise-keeping God. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Amen. Let me invite the elders to come up, would you please? In just a moment, I'm going to be asking Brett a set of questions by which he'll, in his answers, reaffirm um, commitments that he's made both as an elder and now as our senior pastor. And at the end, um, there are two questions that I'll ask you to respond to. Um, you can just say, we do, we will. Um, in fact, I'm going to ask if you would stand now, all of us as you bear witness to Brett's responses to these questions. Brett, do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior? I do. And do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God, totally trustworthy, fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, the supreme, final, and the only infallible rule of faith and practice? I do. And do you affirm without reservation the statement of faith of this church? And do you promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with the statement of faith, that you will on your own initiative make known to the other elders the change which has taken place in your views? I do. Do you promise to submit to your fellow elders in the Lord? I do with God's help. Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in promoting the truths of the gospel and the purity and peace of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise to you on that account. I do, with God's help. Will you be faithful and diligent in the exercise of this office, and will you endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your manner of life, and to walk with exemplary holiness before this congregation? I will, by the grace of God. Brett, are you willing to take responsibility as an elder to oversee the ministry and the resources of this church and to devote yourself to prayer, the ministry of the word, and the shepherding of God's flock, relying upon the grace of God mm -hmm. in such a way that Crossway Community Church and the entire church of Jesus Christ will be blessed? I am, with God's help. And now, Crossway, do you, the members of Crossway Community Church, acknowledge and publicly receive this man as your senior pastor and as a gift of Christ to this church. 
And will you love him and pray for him in his ministry and work together with him humbly and cheerfully that by the grace of God you may accomplish the mission of the church, giving him support in this leadership role to which the Lord has called him to the glory and honor of God. Right, come, we're going to pray for you. Um, Yeah, Kim and the kids, sorry about that. Would you please pray with me for Brett? Father, we praise you and thank you for Jesus, the head of this church. He has been so faithful in leading us. Today, we think of your faithfulness as you brought Brett, Kim, and their family back to Crossway at just the right time. Thank you for how you have gifted and prepared Brett You have confirmed this to the elders and to the church for the responsibility of senior and primary teaching pastor of this church under the headship of Jesus. Thank you for your love and your mercy demonstrated in the gift of this man to our church. We pray that you will fill Brett with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so he will walk in a manner worthy of you fully pleasing you and bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of you. Please strengthen Brett with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. We ask that you help Brett to be faithful and zealous in teaching and promoting the truths of scripture with a gospel at its center. That he would adorn himself with humility as he submits himself to you in this leadership role of Crossway, alongside his fellow elders. Please help Brett to exercise his responsibility faithfully and diligently as he oversees the ministry of the word and the shepherding of your flock to the blessing of Crossway. Help the gospel to be reflected in his life and to walk in holiness before you and this congregation. We ask that you would protect Brett from temptation and evil, being continually devoted to prayer. Father, we ask you to graciously give Brett gifts of godly wisdom and leadership in all humility as he leads the Council of Elders and the pastoral staff. Provide discernment as he prepares each week your word and message to Crossway. Help him to bring the truth of the gospel winsomely and boldly as he trains and counsels others. Thank you for your continual provision for Brett and for Crossway. Father, your word tells us to remember our leaders and to consider the outcome of their life. We love the Wendells. This church wants good for their family. Lord, may the people of Crossway prove to be a cheerful and consistent support to them. Grant us endurance in praying and caring for them. We ask that Brett's role as husband and father and senior pastor would be marked by joy sustain and guide his leadership. And Lord, we thank you for Kim. Her role is vital and weighty. Your grace is sufficient for Kim, for your power is made perfect in weakness. We pray you'd quickly bring to mind the promises that are hers in Christ as she labors to be a godly wife, mother, and member of this church body. And thank you, God, for the Wendell kids. We are so grateful for their presence in our lives. We pray that the scriptures would increasingly become the controlling influence in Joshua, Asher, and Lizzie's life. You love to deliver your own. So we pray 
Lord, bring your salvation to this entire household. May the Wendell home be a soft place to land, where love and laughter and conversation are commonplace. And may this church be a safe place to discover your goodness through your word and your people. As a church, we pray, guard the hearts and minds of each member of the Wendell family. Please give them roots that go deep and fruitfulness that brings you glory. In Jesus' holy name, we pray all of these things. Amen. And now it is my very great joy, I feel like I'm at a wedding, <laughs> to present to you for the very first time the new senior pastor of Crossway Community Church, Brett Wendell. <laughs> Blessings on you. If you all would just grab your seat for a, a second. So just a handful of things I wanted to point out. Uh, first, I just want to recognize actually Bill and Marge Elaine. Would you guys stand up? Uh, you, I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, Bill and Marge are Brett's parents who drove up from central Illinois, and Elaine is Kim's mom. Thank you for being here. Love you guys too. Yeah. <laughs> And then, Brett, Kim, we, Brett, we know you've already expressed your desire to serve us and care for us. And what we want to say as a body to you is that we want to care for you. Not just because of the things you're going to help us with, but we want to care for your marriage because we love you as members of this church. And so this is just a way to um, continue your weekly rhythm, I believe, of getting breakfast, to, breakfast together. We want you to keep doing that. And then, kiddos... We love you guys, not just because you're daddy's and mommy's kids, but we love you, and because God loves you, and we want you guys to enjoy a sweet treat uh, from this church. So Joshua, Asher, Lizzie, and you guys did something today that a lot of people have never done, which is go through two whole services <laughs> in the front row. So well done. And then uh, I intentionally am doing this third. Uh, Brett, this is a Bible, and just like M Mike has charged you, please, brother, Bring us and feed us from this word week in and week out. All right. Now, well, let's stand together and close in song. <clears throat>
There are just a handful of donuts left, so if you, if you can get there, you might get another one. Parents, make sure, you, kids, listen to your parents on that one. Um, but in closing, uh, really a blessing for all of us, but particularly to the Bullmores and the Wendells. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.